everyone. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Great, Thank great. you for, for joining us. We determined that we would not begin until your arrival. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. We are joined by uh, Commissioner Sabir and Commissioner Smith already, as well as a bevy, if you will, of perhaps the most significant faith leaders in the Philadelphia area. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, your diligence in joining us this afternoon. And we want to, uh, in the interest of um, some degree of punctuality, begin our program. And uh, I'm going to do that now. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Malcolm Bird, CEO of the Philadelphia Forum for Faith, Law, and Civics, otherwise known as Forum Philly, Inc. I welcome you on behalf of Forum Philly and the participating trusted leaders of the 15 collaborating religious judicatories and professional clergy organizations representing hundreds of congregations in and around the city of Philadelphia, all of whom you will hear from shortly. As we partner with the Philadelphia City Commissioner's Office, led by Chairwoman Lisa Dealey, Vice Chairman Al Smith, and Member Commissioner Omar Sabir, as they partner to convene the inaugural Philadelphia Faith Leaders Election Roundtable. We thank all of our faith leaders and commissioners for generously dedicating their time to this roundtable. Today's roundtable is designed to provide clergy who educate voters with the most current, accurate, and official nonpartisan information from those exclusively and ultimately responsible election authorities for the city of Philadelphia to provide participants and viewers the most dependable information for voting during this election cycle, that is our Philadelphia City Commissioners. All of us appreciate that Philadelphia voters are preparing for the most historically significant presidential election of the 21st century. As faith leaders, we recognize our moral and civic responsibility to facilitate thorough, nonpartisan education, voter-free, responsible, and informed, informed exercise of their constitutional rights and duty to vote. We soberly and prayerfully acknowledge that the energetic voting of Philadelphia voters may likely be ground zero or perhaps the most the epicenter for the most nationally impactful election activity likely to determine the outcome of the election. Just a brief overview about the format of today's round table. Following introductions by our participating faith leaders and my introduction of the city commissioners, the city commissioners will give brief introductory remarks. A distinguished panel of collaborating religious leaders will facilitate questions from participating clergy in the city commissioners, uh, yeah. to the city commissioners associated with critical content areas. The round table will consider five criti critical content areas, voter registration, voter education, voter rules, voter safety and governance, uh, and then following, and that's city governments, following the question and answer period, the city commissioners and collaborating clergy will share brief closing remarks and advisement to clergy educators. Join us now 
as we are prepared for this round table with sacred prayer, reflection, and meditation from Major Tawny Cowan Zanders, the Divisional Secretary to the Salvation Army of Greater Philadelphia, followed by Imam Nadim Abdul Kabir, representing Montalise Ashura of Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley. And concluding this segment is, is Rabbi David Levin, representing the Board of Rabbis of Greater Philadelphia. This period will be followed by the round table rationale and purpose statement presented by Reverend Robert Collier Sr., president of the Black Clergy of Philadelphia and Vicinity. Following President Collier, we will begin collaborator and partner introductions. Thank you. Shall we pray? Lord God, I join today with my brothers and sisters seeking to better understand the issues and concerns that confront our nation and how we as a faith community should be compelled to respond. Lord, we ask for eyes that are free from blindness so that we might see each other as brothers and sisters, one and equal in dignity, especially those who are victims of abuse violence, deceit, and poverty. We ask for ears that will hear the cries of children and the men and women oppressed because of race or creed or religion or gender. We ask for minds and hearts that are open to hearing the voice of leaders who will bring us closer to unity. Father, we pray for discernment so that we may choose leaders who live in love and truth as they seek to serve the community. And Father, above all, may our deepest desire be to love mercy, to seek justice, and walk humbly with you. Amen. Amen. Imam Nadim Abdul Kabir. And you are on mute, sir. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, sir. And alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Translated, praise be to our creator and prayers of peace to our exalted prophets and the pious who follow them. Our creator, we ask for you, especially at this time, to give us guidance. There are several individuals who are seeking to step up to be shepherds, to be guides, there has been a call that I know that you have heard that specifically this country, the United States, America, should be made great again. And we know that if it was ever great, it was through, it was through the, the attachment to your guidance. Using your examples of political greatness, and wisdom. It was you who withdrew Joseph from the dark and cold and dank depths and raised him to a level high in the ministry of the government. It was you who withdrew Moses from the cold, perhaps dark, and damp courses of the Nile to raise him into the house of the supreme commander of the nation that he was in at, at that time. There can be no greatness without your guidance, O oh Lord. We ask that you guide us. 
we know and we pray that there can be no guidance, there can be no greatness without your guidance. Please make this happen for us and grant us the best that you will in the best possible way. We ask this in your name. Amen. Oh Lord, make it so. Amen. Amen. And Rabbi David Levin. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Dear God, the Holy One of Blessing, we thank you for the blessings of our country and to be present at this critical time in our country's evolution. The idea that power is in the hands of the people is among the greatest ideas of the American political system. It is like a keystone upon which everything rests. And it is a precious sacred gift from you that we cherish. Many have sought to broaden its scope so all are properly enfranchised and many have sacrificed everything in order to ensure it. We are gratified to see the long lines of people civilly demanding that their voices are heard in the early voting elsewhere in the country, as opposed to the cynicism or perhaps hopelessness, wherein people willingly give up their right to vote, thinking that their vote does not matter. This sacrosanct right and privilege that we have, however, remains fragile. Throughout history, we have seen systematic attempts by those in power to deny this fundamental civil right to so many. For too long, too many have been unable to be counted, denied this fundamental right, and current political turmoil combined with a pandemic have added to these challenges. But we, today, we are here. As faith leaders and stakeholders in our country, we gather today as champions of this sacred idea and as activists, we are engaged in ensuring our citizens no. have the opportunity to exercise the right to vote safely, securely, and knowing that their vote will count. We ask you, our God, to give us strength in this endeavor. Guide us with your strong hand and an outstretched arm so that we may lead your people. You always will be. I don't want to shoot your head. Today, may we learn and then mobilize to make it so. May this be your will. And let us say amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Thank you, Rabbi Levin. We are going to ask that all, all persons who are not speaking that you please mute your telephone until it is your time to speak. Uh, please mute your telephone to a listening mode in order that you won't uh, compromise the broadcast. Again, if you are not speaking, please mute your telephone until such time as you will be speaking. We'd like to now uh, invite Reverend Robert Collier Sr., uh, President of the Black Clergy of Philadelphia to share our purpose and rationale for our gathering this afternoon. Good President afternoon. Collier. Thank you very much, Dr. Bird. Good afternoon, I am Reverend Robert Collier Sr., pastor of Galilee Baptist Church in Roxborough and the president of the Black Clergy of Philadelphia and Vicinity. We are gathered here today as judicatory and ministerium leaders of various faiths and tradition in a historic gathering to discuss nonpartisan voter registration, voter education, voter safety, and voter engagement. It is so appropriate that we join together to let our collective voice be heard, urging everyone to vote in one of the most important elections of our lifetime. There are several issues that will impact our quality of life for years to come, like health care, gun control, saving Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, just to name a few. We thank Reverend Dr. Malcolm Byrd for conceiving of this forum and coordinating it, that is history making in itself. We have a distinguished list of panelists and we urge you to listen carefully to each one of them as they impart vital information to assist you in casting your ballot successfully if you have not already done so. We are not telling you whom to vote for. 
but we are asking and urging you to exercise your constitutional right and do cast your vote. Vote as though your life depends upon it because we believe it does. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, President Collier. At this time, our faith leaders will uh, introduce themselves for the public record. Uh, and uh, leaders, you may begin at this point, uh, introducing yourselves for our audience and our commissioners. I am Imam Kenneth Nordine. I am the Imam of the Philadelphia Messier Claire Muhammad School. I also sit with the uh, Religious Community Council at the University of Penn and the Interfaith Center of Philadelphia. I'm Rabbi Bhatti Glazer. I'm here on behalf of the Philadelphia Board of Rabbis. I'm Connie Cowan Sanders with the uh, Greater Philadelphia Salvation Army. I'm responsible for all of the operations of the Salvation Army in Greater Philadelphia. Good afternoon. My name is Guy Glimp. I serve as the jurisdictional prelate of the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Good afternoon. I'm Imam Nadam Abdul Khabir. I'm representing the Masley Sashura of Philadelphia in the Delaware Valley. Uh, I sit with the Religious Leaders Council um, as a uh, member and administrator. I also uh, have uh, had a seat 20 years as a, with Philadelphia Police Chaplaincy. Thank you, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. I'm um, Reverend Ruben Ortiz. I serve as Executive Director of Hispanic Clergy of Philadelphia and vicinity. And I also see some colleagues here uh, sitting on Administrative Council of the uh, Religious Leaders Council. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Clarence Wright. I'm the pastor of the Love Zion Baptist Church in North Philadelphia, president of the Pennsylvania Progressive Baptist Alliance of the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and uh, first vice president of the Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference of Philadelphia and Vicinity. I'm Patricia Davenport, and I have the privilege of serving as bishop in Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the five county area here. Good afternoon, I'm Rabbi David Levin. I'm here on behalf of the Board of Rabbis of Greater Philadelphia. Uh, we have several more who are muted, but we invite you to unmute and to introduce yourselves. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rabbi Leah Berkowitz. I'm also here with the, with the Philadelphia Board of Rabbis. Uh, Rabbi Merrill Crean, uh, I'm a chaplain in the larger Philadelphia area. I'm here as a member of the Board of Rabbis. I'm uh, Rabbi Barry Dove Lerner. I got the message and I decided to come attend. I've been part of Interfaith for about 60 years. Wish you well. Can you hear me, Dr. Bird? We can hear you now, Bishop. Okay, Bishop Gregory Ingram of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, First Episcopal District, encompasses seven states, including uh, Bermuda, uh, representing 358 uh, churches. Thank you. I believe that Bishop Morris is uh, maybe our final uh, faith leader on, thy on our line. And Bishop, you are on mute, uh, so you must unmute in order to be heard. While Bishop is working through technical difficulties. Oh, Bishop, are you there? Okay. 
Um, I see our colleague and friend, uh, Brad, would you also introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm not a pastor or reverend. I'm a guest of uh, the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Bird. Um, I recently stepped down as a uh, commissioner for uh, Governor Wolf's Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. Uh, and I've been doing uh, nonprofit voter registration with a lot of uh, Asian uh, temples, churches, and so on in Pennsylvania. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more time, uh, Bishop uh, Mars, if you are available now and uh, you'd like to introduce yourself, we invite you to do so, sir. That is, that is Bishop Ernest Morris, the uh, jurisdictional prelate of the Koinia jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ and the regional bishop in this area. Thank you, Bishop Glimp, for uh, assisting uh, Bishop Morris. We really do appreciate that. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our Philadelphia City Commissioners, and it is my privilege to do so. Uh, and welcome them to uh, this uh, historic Philadelphia Faith Leaders Election Roundtable. Commissioner Lisa Dealey was sworn in as Philadelphia's newest city commissioner on January the 4th of 2016. Since then, as city commissioner, she has made it a priority to bring the electoral process to the citizens of Philadelphia. In December of 2017, Commissioner Dealey was voted by her fellow commissioners to be chairwoman of the Philadelphia Commissioners. As chairwoman, she has worked to make the office more transparent and accountable to the citizens of Philadelphia. She has used her extensive background in constituent services and outreach to bring the commissioner's office to the people. Each year, Commissioner Dealey commemorates National Voter Registration Day by organizing a wide reaching citywide effort to teach Philadelphia students about the voting process and get them registered to vote. Prior to running for office, Commissioner Dealey worked in Philadelphia City Council. Welcome Commissioner Dealey. Commissioner Al Smith was first elected to City Commissioner of Philadelphia in November of 2011 and currently serves as Vice Chairman of the Commission. Since being elected, he has worked to modernize election operations, improve efficiency, and bring integrity to the election process. Commissioner Smith is a former senior analyst with a top secret security clearance at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which is the investigative arm of the U.S. Congress, uh, where he assisted members of Congress in conducting oversight of government agency programs and policies to identify and eliminate waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. Prior to joining GAO, Commissioner Smith served as a policy analyst for the Presidential Commission on Holocaust Assets in the United States. Commissioner Omar Sabir was elected on November the 5th, 2019 and sworn in as city commissioner of the city of Philadelphia on January the 6th, 2020. Commissioner Sabir remains committed to empowering all Philadelphians to participate in the voting process by tackling voter apathy and educating communities about the importance of civic engagement. Prior to serving as city commissioner, Commissioner Sabir worked for the office of State Senator Vincent Hughes, the Nathaniel Sabir Memorial Scholarship Fund, and the first judicial district of Pennsylvania. Most notably, Commissioner Sabir was the architect of the popular Vote Philly Vote campaign 
for the 2018 midterm elections. Commissioner Sabir is a husband, father of six children, and a lifelong Philadelphian. He is a graduate of Cheney University and attended the small business education program at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Would you all join me in welcoming now our Philadelphia City Commissioners? We will uh, begin uh, our round of questioning to the commissioners uh, in this order. We will give consideration to issues of voter registration. Of that round of questioning will be led by Reverend Ruben Ortiz of the Hispanic Clergy of Philadelphia and Vicinity. The content area of voter education that session will be facilitated by Dr. Clarence Wright of the Pennsylvania uh, Progressive Baptist Alliance and Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference of Philadelphia. Voter rules led by Rabbi Bataya Glazier of the Board of Rabbis of Greater Philadelphia. Voter protection and safety led by Bishop Patricia Davenport of Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod of the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And finally, uh, city governance having to do with questions on the ballot by Iman Kenneth uh, Nuruddin of the Philadelphia Mass Jid. Uh, thank you and you may begin your questioning now, uh, Reverend Ortiz. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Bird, and blessings to my uh, uh, faith colleagues uh, this afternoon. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the commissioners, uh, Schmidt, Sabir, and Dealey for taking the time uh, in such a busy season, as I can imagine, uh, is for many of us, but especially uh, for you all uh, and so many details uh, at this point in time. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, uh, a great honor to be representing Hispanic clergy of Philadelphia and Vicinia as its uh, executive director for the last uh, five years. Uh, and I also represent uh, Esperanza. Um, and uh, we're not just local, but we also uh, support a lot of efforts uh, nationally. Uh, the voter engagement uh, in the Hispanic community, particularly the Hispanic community of faith, does include uh, voter registration drives. Uh, and I'm glad to hear some of the work that the commissioners have done, uh, particularly among our youth. Uh, and we have youth ministries involved in healthy voter registration competitions. Uh, we've done bike rides, uh, voter awareness and education. Uh, we have uh, quite a few churches doing civic engagement Sundays beginning from three weeks ago. Uh, get out the vote. Um, and uh, we have upcoming uh, uh, robocalling and phone backing, banking as well. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, probably what would be some of the most common questions that have arisen uh, from, the, from the Latino community um, and being mindful of the time of others as well. Um, so the first question is, when must uh, mail-in ballots need to be postmarked by, and is this a safe and secure process? So, uh, yes, it's a safe and secure uh, process. Now, when you say ballots, do you mean ballots or do you mean applications, just for clarity? Uh, th in this case, it would be the, uh, those who already have filled out the applications and have the, uh, the ballots. Okay, right. Uh, so the ballots have to be uh, postmarked uh, by uh, November. I'm sorry, you're on Commiss mute. Commissioner, you have gone on mute, unfortunately. You're back uh, now. Oh yeah, okay, yes. So uh, the Supreme Court uh, just had a ruling that allows uh, ballots uh, for us to be received to us. As long as they're received by November the 6th, uh, we can count them as long as they're postmarked uh, by November the 3rd. Uh, but again, I want to uh, encourage people that if they want to apply uh, for vote by mail, they apply as soon as possible. Uh, you can go to PhiladelphiaVotes.com and you can apply uh, for your ballot. You can do it online. It takes less than uh, five minutes. You know, our deadline is October 27th for you to apply. 
But again, we're encouraging people to do it now. There still have been delays uh, in the postal service. So again, we want you uh, to do it as soon as possible. Uh, that's what we want to tell our, our family and friends. But also too, I want everyone to take advantage of the satellite locations that we have. Uh, in those satellite locations, you can request a ballot. You can get registered to vote. You can request a replacement ballot. Or, you know, if you have any uh, questions, you know, you, you can ask your questions. And you also can drop off your ballot at these satellite locations. Mm -hmm. And they're open uh, seven, seven days a week. Uh, you can go to PhiladelphiaVotes.com to get all the locations, all the times. But uh, I definitely want you to tell uh, your uh, constituents uh, that they should take full advantage of these satellite uh, locations. So there is still time uh, for someone who doesn't have a ballot and has not uh, filled out the application yet, still to request an application and uh, request for a ballot. Yes, they can do it all at one, all at one time at the satellite locations. Uh, again, uh, you know, even uh, closer to the Hispanic um, area, right at Fourth and Lehigh, uh, you know, there's location right there where you can just walk right in, literally. The whole process, if you're already a registered voter, for you to request uh, your ballot, it might take about 10 minutes, literally. You know, if you're already registered and you're walking in, you're requesting now, it might be a line. I'm talking about far as the process of you getting into the office and making that request for that ballot. It's only, it's only 10 minutes and however long does it take you to vote. I mean, you can do it all in one shot. You know, you can request the ballot, you can drop it off right there. You have a safe private place where you can uh, fill out your ballot and then, uh, you know, you're done. You don't have to worry about the mail and all that other stuff. You know, it's just, it's the easy process. So I'm encouraging, uh, you know, our citizens of Philadelphia to take full uh, advantage of these. And, uh, you know, we will have uh, 17, our goal is to have 17 locations open uh, to the public. Uh, they can take advantage of these uh, satellite locations. And uh, another of, of a common question um, from our community is, uh, are the, uh, a, the polls uh, keeping the same hours as they have traditionally, or will they be open earlier and closed later? So the poll, the po in-person voting on Tuesday, <coughs> November the 3rd, will be conducted as, as it usually is. Uh, the polls will open at 7 a.m. and they will be closed at 8 p.m. However, as Commissioner Sabir stated, uh, Philadelphia voters have additional opportunities to have their voice heard and their vote cast. Um, in these satellite centers, uh, they can go right now and in a one-stop shop, register to vote, request their mail-in ballot, vote that ballot, and hand it back to election personnel and then they don't even have to worry about November 3rd because all their business is done. Uh, this is a new and expanded opportunity to access to voting for Philadelphians that we've never had before. So um, even though election day, we've typically seen it always, it was just election day. Uh, election day has now been expanded uh, to include this early period where voters can request their mail-in ballot in person. Mm -hmm. And the deadline to register to vote in order to qualify uh, to vote for this upcoming election is October the 19th. And a common question is that uh, October the 19th, regular business hours or, uh, or midnight, um, October the 19th? Well, we have to receive the application in, on, or before October 19th, uh, unless someone applies online on or before October 19th. It's very easy to apply to register to vote online if you have a Pennsylvania driver's license or Pennsylvania issued uh, state identification. Um, that's what's really used to verify your identity. You've already provided a signature as you would when you would register to vote on a paper application. Mm -hmm. So like all of these deadlines, and as my fellow commissioners have said really unless you can avoid i mean unless it can't be avoided no one should wait until the deadlines 
the earlier people apply to register who need to register, the earlier people apply to vote by mail, uh, the better. The sooner the, they apply, the sooner the ballots can go out and the sooner they can come back to us. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, give the opportunity if any of my uh, colleagues here have any questions regarding um, any of the deadlines uh, before I pass it on um, regarding the topic uh, of the question, line of questions. This is Rabbi Meryl Crean. This isn't exactly about deadlines, although it's related. Um, what happens if you have, um, if someone has applied for a mail-in ballot and doesn't receive one? So there's a couple of options. One would be to go to one of the satellite board of elections offices uh, that um, Chairwoman Dealey and Commissioner Sabir mentioned. They can go in person, they can request the ballot, receive the ballot, vote the ballot, and return it back to us. Uh, there's also a, um, an online option for people to apply for a placement ballot in the event that one was mailed out and never reached people. Mm. Frequently, people will register to vote and they'll include a sort of general address. Like the, the I used to live at uh, 2601 Pennsylvania Avenue, but it was an apartment building. But I was registered at 2601 Pennsylvania Avenue with no apartment. So people don't really, normal people don't really think that much about it. They'll apply and the ballot will get sent out and then returned to us because the address is undeliverable or if they moved and have forwarding mail, ballots won't be forwarded. So there's a couple of reasons why uh, mail will be sent out and it won't reach its destination. And that's not because of a failure of the postal service. It's because the uh, mailing address is incomplete um, or people have moved and are no longer living, uh, living at that address anymore. But they can apply for a placement ballot or go in person to a satellite office and take care of it all in a sort of one-stop shop. And what are the dates for that? I mean, if you don't receive your ballot by a such and such a date, or how long do you wait? Well, we have to receive that ballot back, um, whether if it's dropped to us on or before election day at 8 p.m. If it's mailed back to us, we can receive it you know, like Commissioner Sabir said, a couple days later, but it has to be mailed on or before election day. Um, to replace, a, if, if you've applied and we sent out a ballot and it didn't reach you, you can go to a satellite like location and request a replacement up until and on election day. Or you could go to your polling place and vote by provisional ballot. All right, thank you. In order to keep uh, moving us forward, I'm gonna uh, pass this on to Dr. Uh, uh, Wright um, on uh, questions, uh, uh, line of questions around uh, voter education. All right, thank you. Be thank you very before much. you begin, uh, Dr. Wright, I, I was disconnected uh, by video and audio, uh, and I think we may have been affected by our Facebook live broadcast. We are attempting to correct that now. Uh, if you are able to share on uh, Facebook, we do ask you to do that. We'll continue to work on the technical issues here. Uh, go go uh, right ahead. Uh, right. It's, yeah, it's still showing you live on, on my end. Oh, great. Uh, oh, wonderful. I, I think we were spared. Uh, oh, great. So let's continue. Reverend Ortiz, first of all, thank you for that line of questioning. Uh, and uh, to all of our commissioners, Commissioner Dealey, Commissioner Sabir, and Commissioner Schmidt, thank you so much for taking time out uh, today. Uh, I understand this is uh, your the busiest time, not only of the year, but probably the busiest time in, in a four-year cycle for you all. So we really appreciate you coming to answer these questions today. Um, my, my questions are, uh, some are kind of related to what Reverend Ortiz had, uh, but but uh, others are, are more general, just on the topic of voter education itself. 
um, questions surrounding uh, those satellite locations that you have mentioned um, around uh, day of voting locations on November 3rd, um, timeline for the count, and um, questions around returning citizens. So uh, four questions, and then I'll pass the baton uh, to our, our next presenter. Uh, so uh, as far as the satellite locations, there, um, we, we heard the number 17 floated around a lot uh, of 17 sites that would eventually be open. Um, and to my knowledge, the most recent number I've heard is uh, eight locations that are open. You can correct me if I'm not correct on, on that number. Uh, but my question is, uh, are all 17 going to be open? And if so, what is the timeline for that, seeing as how we're, we're about three weeks out from, from the election? Okay, so we have, uh, uh, by Saturday, we'll have 11 uh, locations open. And in some of the other locations, we have uh, drop off, do I have limited services? So again, uh, you know, as a staff and we're training people every single day, and as soon as, you know, it's on a rolling uh, mission, and again, uh, you know, we will have them open. But again, we have 11 locations open, uh, which is, uh, you know, we're covering the city pretty well. But again, we're still working on getting uh, those other, uh, the other locations open. Okay, and, and to get the most current information on sites that are open and what their hours are, would it be the same Philadelphia Votes site or is there a different site? PhiladelphiaVotes.com, PhiladelphiaVotes.com. I'll say it one more time. Okay. PhiladelphiaVotes.com. That's the trusted uh, information, you know, uh, that people can get, you know, information. It changes day by day, you know. So, again, uh, please, PhiladelphiaVotes.com. That has all the information. Okay. Thank you. The uh, uh, next question is about uh, the polling locations uh, on November 3rd. Uh, we, we know... Uh, that it was uh, uh, through no fault of your own, uh, but it was, uh, let's be honest, a disaster in May uh, because of uh, COVID and, and the reduction of, of sites. And we know that it has been um, restored almost to uh, the full complement as of the most recent news. Uh, I don't remember the number, but I rem it was around 800. If you can probably fill me in on the exact number. Uh, but uh, my question is, um, how, how many are we down from our normal complement, and uh, for how does someone know if their polling location has has moved, uh, and uh, will that affect their registration status? Is there something else that someone uh, should should uh, should do to determine their ability to vote on November third? Well, I'm asking my colleague uh, Commissioner uh, Schmidt uh, to speak about that, but I will say, as far as the primary being a disaster. Uh, you know, what I look at as far as Wisconsin, uh, you know, Georgia and a couple of other states, I would consider those to be disasters. I wouldn't consider what happened in the primary a disaster. Well, as someone, so, not, not to be confrontational, but as someone who pastors a church that is a polling location, I can tell you uh, many people came to our door looking to vote and were disappointed uh, when they could not find it. So. Uh, when one vote is not able to be cast, I, I, I don't consider that ever to be accessible, uh, to, to be acceptable. That, but again, that's, and that's very well, I fair. Don't, I don't think that's your fault. It's very fair. And every one of those voters also received a postcard from us leading up to the election telling them where their polling place was on election day. Um, we have limited ability to communicate with all of our voters. We had to consolidate considerably deploying places in the primary election because of the COVID situation. Philadelphia has 1,703 divisions in the city. We normally vote out of 830 polling places because some are co-located. In the primary, that was reduced through no desire of our own to about 190 locations in the city because we lost most of our polling places. Either they refused or we couldn't get in contact with them. If a, if a, if a polling place is at a barbershop and the barbershop's not open, there's no one there to answer the phone. There's no one there to return our mail or anything else like that. The goal of this election 
is to have as many polling places open as possible to make the election as normal as possible in terms of the in-person voting experience. And while normally we have about 830, we will have north of 700 open this election. Again, all 1,703 divisions will be able to vote. They'll just be located at more than 700 locations instead of 800 locations. Every voter in the city will receive a postcard from us, again, telling them where their polling place is on election day. Um, all of those polling places that we'll have open, the reason why we have fewer than we normally have is because we have lost all of the firehouses in the city that are frequently polling places. We have lost most of the senior centers and nursing homes that are frequently polling places. Mm -hmm. Some stayed open because all of the voters in that, in that division live in that nursing home. Like a nursing home may be so big that all of the voters live there. Other ones aren't that big. And they include blocks around the nursing home. And those nursing homes are understandably concerned about people from the outside coming into their facilities to vote on election day. So we lost our firehouses, we lost most of our nursing homes and senior centers and other things like that. We have been able to get it over 700 places open uh, for election day. While election lines are big in a presidential election year, in the primary, about half of all voters in the city voted by mail. So we had 175,000 vote by mail and 175,000 vote at the polls. If the same holds true for the general election and turnout is 700,000, let's say, and we get 350,000 people vote by mail, that's 350,000 fewer voters showing up at those polling places on election day, which will help reduce lines, which will help reduce pressure on the election boards um, uh, to, to get, get voters voting. Um, so for the general election, it'll look a lot like a regular presidential election. Just hopefully half of our voters will have voted already. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, just, just one quick follow up question. It, what, is there anything from an education standpoint that you think us as faith leaders can do to facilitate uh, our, our congregations uh, being aware of their, their voting locations. Uh, so if we have members of our uh, churches, masjids, temples, uh, synagogues, uh, et cetera, who uh, may be affected by their polling place being closed, what can we do to make sure that they're, they're educated uh, to where to go? Well, in addition to the cards that are being, that will be sent out in advance of election day, and we just finalized the last of those polling places yesterday, 20 days before the election, which is when we always do it every election ever. Um, to repeat now for, uh, to repeat uh, Commissioner Sabir for the fourth time, um, PhiladelphiaVotes.com has a, a, look, a find your polling place link or tool that you can put your address in and it'll tell you where your polling place is on election day. Um, it's difficult for us to reach everybody all the time. A lot of people are not, you know, sitting in front of a laptop all day, like we are right now for the most part. Um, but there is the ability to look up on your computer to see where your polling place is in the event that you didn't receive or, you know, didn't look at and tossed out the postcard telling you where your polling place is. Um, uh, the next is about the timeline for the count. Uh, and we know uh, there's early voting uh, or, or, or early satellite sites, whether you call it early voting or not, uh, is, is a question of semantics, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the November 3rd election date, and we've heard November 6th is uh, now the, the date that they need to be counted and submitted by. Can, can any of you commissioners speak to uh, the timeline of, of when we will have a result, uh, either for the city of Philadelphia or for Pennsylvania itself, uh, based on um, uh, the multiplicity of, of ways to vote uh, that are going on in this unique year? So, thank you. Um, so, on, just like June, 
you know, we can talk about June, but one thing we did learn in June, we learned a lot of things, but one thing we really learned was that it takes a long time to count hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots. So even though we are, we have these options, we have these satellite vote centers, we have these drop boxes, they've extended the time, you know, the state law prohibits us from being able to count any votes on, to even begin counting until election day. And just for clarity, there is, there is early voting in some states, but what we, what we have in Pennsylvania is not early voting. Yeah. It is in-person mail-in voting. So early voting, when people talk about early voting, when you're watching like, you know, 60 minutes or something, and they're showing you states where early voting is occurring, they're actually going in and are voting on voting machines or, or, or uh, you know, handmark paper ballots. They're actually voting right there. Where our, uh, in Pennsylvania, we're doing in-person mail-in voting. So those votes are being handled in the same fashion. So even if you go to a satellite center, they're giving you your ballot. That ballot's being folded up and you still have to do it, put it in the envelope, put it in the secrecy envelope, put it in the declaration envelope in the same fashion that you would if that mail-in ballot uh, came to your home. So because the state law does not allow us to start counting until election day, that's when all those ballots will begin get, you know, begin getting uh, opened up, sorted, scanned, and counted. Uh, we will have our vote count on election night that Philadelphians are used to um, from our voting machines because those those counts that we're going to get from the in-person voting, they'll come to us that night. So those numbers will come in. The mail-in votes, the votes that we're getting in the satellite centers, they are going to take a little bit of time. However, we were able to uh, industrialize that process. So we have uh, millions of dollars worth of equipment that is going to enable us to count those votes faster, but what we won't sacrifice any accuracy. So um, we are, you know, committed to making sure that Philadelphians and quite frankly, the nation, because everybody's looking right to see what's happening in Pennsylvania, will have that vote count as fast as possible, but it will be an accurate count. Thank you. Uh, final question uh, before I pass it on to our, our, our uh, next topic is uh, regarding the issue of returning citizens. Um, I, I listened to uh, a podcast that the former district attorney of Philadelphia, Seth Williams, was a part of, and as we know, uh, he was uh, recently uh, incarcerated and released, uh, served his time, and it was uh, it, it was shocking to know that Seth Williams, who was the district attorney, the highest legal position, uh, he himself did not know that he had a right to vote, uh, uh, and. And if, if the former district attorney uh, was not aware that he, uh, as, as a recently returned citizen, was able to vote, um, how many of our uh, members of our congregations uh, uh, or members of our, of our communities are also not aware uh, that, that whether they're on probation, parole, uh, or, or what have you, uh, still in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, if they have served their time, they're, they're able to register and to vote. Uh, can one of you just, just kind of speak to what is the law, who can vote, and how we can, uh, uh, other than phillyvotes.com, I, 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 I think we, we learned that today, uh, how we can uh, make sure that our, our people are educated, uh, particularly those who are formerly incarcerated. Uh, again, uh, not to beat the horse, but on PhiladelphiaVotes.com, you actually there's actually documentation that you can print out to, that's downloadable in regards to uh, to, uh, to voters' rights. Mm -hmm. So again, so if you are a felon and you have uh, and you left your confinement, then you are uh, eligible uh, to vote if you if you've been convicted of a felony. Now, if you have been convicted of anything other than a felony, even if you are incarcerated, you are still uh, eligible to vote. So that and even if you're awaiting uh, trial, 
you are still uh, eligible uh, to vote by mail. So even if you're in the county uh, jail right now, you are uh, eligible uh, to vote. And again, uh, a lot of the Russian interference and uh, the Chinese interference, and, and even now with the uh, Iranian interference on social media, you know, they're telling uh, our constituents, you know, that felons cannot participate uh, in the process. So again, which is misinformation, right? And that's what voter suppression in Philadelphia looks like, right? It's not dogs, it's not uh, water hoses being used on you, it's, it's misinformation. And so we're gonna stress, uh, you know, trusted and credible uh, messengers. But again, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, PhiladelphiaVotes.com, VotesPA, uh, CommitteeOf70.org, the ACLU, you know, those are all trusted uh, messengers. They're trusted websites that you can use to download uh, any of the information. But you know, again, if you are a felon and you have left your confinement, then you are eligible uh, to vote. And if you've been convicted of uh, a, a crime uh, to do with like voting fraud, you know, there's a time that you can't participate. But other than that, uh, you can uh, participate in the process. Thank you, Commissioner. I if I may, just uh, just to put a cap on that, one of my uh, proudest achievements since being a commissioner is um, I we work with the prisons, uh, every, and every six months I film a PS for the in, at the prison that is um, aired on their closed circuit television, and it instructs them uh, on how to vote, how to register to vote, and now how to fill in the mm -hmm. ballot application. And we work with staff at the prisons um, on getting those applications back, making sure they're all filled out properly so that the, the people that um, are awaiting trial um, or that are eligible otherwise that are in the prisons are uh, able to vote to make sure that they have access to that vote. Um, so that's been one of my passions and we do it, like I said, every six months I go and I film a PSA and we, there's a, a great group of people at the prisons that actually um, help with the completion of those applications and we work closely with the staff at the prisons to get the applications to make sure the information is accurate and to make sure that those folks are getting a ballot and they're having access to voting. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Dr. Wright and thank you commissioners. I want to pause just to inquire of our faith leaders if any of you have specific questions regarding voter registration or voter education issues that have not been addressed by the commissioners that you ask them at this time before we transition to Rabbi Bataya Glazier. Any uh, leader on the line who has a question concerning voter registration or voter education, now is the time to ask that question. I had uh, raised my hand. Uh, perhaps you didn't see it. Um, but I just wanted to um, comment on uh, Commissioner Smith's guidance. Um, I did just check the um, poll locator tool, and I put in two different um, uh, addresses, and it works very well, very well. So I want everyone to know that. Um, it's not instantaneous, but... Um, a second or two, you get responses for each bit of information that you provide so that it can do its job and it will direct you to um, your polling place in your area based on your street and your uh, house address. And if I can Thank add you. Well, Thank you, you Imam. Add, but like, and if I can add as well, you can use that on your phone. So even if you don't have a computer, you can actually access that on your telephone as well. If you have a regular smartphone, if you can access Facebook, you know, you can access PhiladelphiaVotes.com and pull up your, uh, your polling location. Thank you, Commissioner. And I should have made it clear that while I was sitting here, I did it on my phone. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, any other faith leaders, do you have questions on voter registration or voter education for our commissioners? Question. Can you hear me? Go right ahead, Bishop Morris. What what is, what identification are they requiring when you when you go in to vote in person? 
You do not need uh, ID to vote in person. The only time you would be uh, asked for identification is if you were a first time voter or it was your first time voting at a polling location. So in a, in a division. So for example, um, if you you could if you move uh, and you're in a, you're voting in a new place, uh, you're going to be asked for identification just to just so that we can verify that you did move out of where we had you. Uh, if you're 18 and it's the first time you're voting, you're going to get asked for identification. But there is no ID requirement for voting in Pennsylvania. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Do you have any kind of preliminary um, um, numbers of, of new registers? We, we don't, but we will very soon. October the 19th is the last day to register to vote. So we want to make sure that everybody uh, that can be is registered on or before October 19th. And then after that, um, we'll, we'll have uh, all the figures and facts that you need. Okay. Commissioner, would you uh, state that date again for the record, please? October 19th is the last day to register to vote in Pennsylvania. So if you need to make a change or if anybody in your uh, circle is going to be 18 on or before November the 3rd, you want to make sure that they get registered to vote before October 19th. And Commissioner, does that have to be done in person or are there options available to register? Um, Commissioner Sabir, do you want to tell them? PhiladelphiaVotes.com, you have until 11.59 <laughs> p.m. Uh, to get registered online. Okay, does any other faith leader have a question about voter registration or voter education for our commissioners? Okay, if there are none, we now invite <laughs> Rabbi Bataya Glazier to resume our questioning on voter rules and to facilitate questions from our faith leaders. Rabbi? Thank you so much, thank you so much Dr. Bird. Commissioners, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I am pleased to be able to say that I voted at a satellite location last week. And while the line was rather long and it did take a bit of time, it went very smoothly. Um, everyone was very helpful and the, the process was easy to negotiate. So I thank you for that. Um, voter rule, I, I'm, I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk about voter rules because if we don't follow the rules and don't know the rules, people's votes won't count. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'll raise some issues about voter rules and ask you to address them and clarify them. And please also, address anything that has been, you have witnessed is misinformation, right? Particularly the issue that we just discussed about returning citizens and people who are caught up in the justice system. That was a very important conversation, but we wanna be sure that everyone who is eligible to vote knows they can vote. So the, the first issue of course is who can vote and are there people who cannot vote? Who are those people and who are the rest of us? Um, other issues, ballot completion, uh, ballot secrecy, can harvesting, can you hand a ballot to a third person to deliver for you? Um, and then the, the question of uh, candidate levers or straight party voting. Um, and I, I would like to add my personal question onto that is what are the accommodations for voters with disabilities? And I'm happy to go through that list one by one if that's easier. Please, Rabbi. I, I was asking if you could go through them one by one because it's it's a it's a lot. <laughs> it, it is a lot, and you, and and my concern is more that there are other issues that I don't know to ask about that you you may be more aware than I am. Um, but the, the the questions that I have are who can vote. Um, to talk about ballot completion, um, the secrecy of ballots. Can a third person be involved in the process? Can you hand your completed ballot to a third person? And candidate levers. I don't actually understand that question, but it was given to me as something I should ask. If it's I'm easier gonna, to go uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna, um, 
take a try because they're, they're sort of subjects. Um, yeah. So I'm not exactly sure what the questions are within them, but let me, let me, um, let me attempt it. Um, part of getting uh, vote by mail done late last year, like most things in the legislature, uh, was a compromise. And compromise can bring good things and compromise can bring bad things or compromise can come with fine print. One of the things that's definitely fine print with vote by mail is except under extraordinary circumstances, only the voter can cast their own vote by mail ballot. Meaning that in the law, only the voter can put it in the mail or the voter can drop it off at a drop box or the voter can do what you did, which is to go to a satellite location, request it, complete it, and return it. Um, there is an exception, and it's a really narrow exception right now, and we're seeking more guidance from the Pennsylvania Department of State. Because right now, the only exception to voters casting their own vote is that the other voter qualifies as someone covered with the Americans uh, Disabilities Act, the ADA, um, and they have to come from one household. So I could fill out this uh, declaration of agent form, it's called, and take the ballot in from my neighbor if my neighbor, and one person, if my neighbor is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, or I could take it from several people in my own household who are all covered with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the term you're using is household, which is a very narrow definition. And it's one person from outside of your own home or more than one person within your own home. So the good news is people can vote by mail. They can vote from home, right? They can request a ballot by putting in the mail or doing it online, they can get the ballot in the mail, and they can send it back in the mail. The downside is they can only submit their own ballot. Or that's not downside, but like limitation is, right now you can only submit your own ballot except under the circumstances um, that I described. Um, I don't know if that'll change, I don't know if courts will decide otherwise, but right now voters can really unless they fill out a designation of agent form authorizing someone else to carry their ballot. And it can only be, again, one person, um, one time. Um, voters have to cast their own mail-in ballot. And that can just be putting it in the mail for the postman to pick up. Um, you also mentioned um, who can vote. I think that was your first item. Yes. Uh, really, the bottom line is uh, it's the first two questions on a voter registration form. Mm -hmm. um, are you over the age of 18? And are you a United States citizen? One obvious exception to that, which we talked about before, was that incarcerated felons are not um, allowed to vote in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But otherwise, the restrictions are that you're 18 year, years of age or older on election day, um, and that you're a citizen of the United States. Okay. Great. And that's only like 10% of your questions. I'm sorry, Rabbi. Uh, that's cool. That's quite all right. Um, ballot completion. Do you need to complete your own ballot? For a mail-in ballot, I, I there's presume a, that, yeah. yeah, there's a there's a section on the back of a mail-in ballot that um, is an assistance declaration, mm -hmm. which involves the voter signing it or making a mark as best they're able, and the person who assisted them, uh, them signing it, and filling out all their information as well. So there's a mechanism that allows voters to receive uh, assistance in completing their mail-in ballot and returning it to us. Um, obviously, it involves another person, um, right. and that person has to provide their information as well, because it's such an exception, and it's an understandable exception because of 
people with physical uh, or other uh, <clears throat> challenges that don't allow them to easily complete about the way that you know you or I or others might be able to. And and now that's good. That that does not have to be notarized as long as the other person is signing for them. That validates it for them, right? That's right. There's no notarization required for that. Right. It just requires the person assisting you to provide right. all their name and, and signature as well. Right. Thank you, Reverend. Um, the, the other two questions I was asked to, to propose were about secrecy and candidate levers. Okay. Um, I, I'm assuming that the question is about mail-in voting and the need for voters to use the secrecy envelope. So when you get your mail-in ballot package, whether it's in person at a satellite voting office or in the mail, it will come with two envelopes inside. One envelope is the declaration envelope where you would sign your name on the back and, your, and put your information. And the other envelope is a white envelope that says official election. So your ballot, your voted ballot, you fold it up, you have to put it in the white envelope and then the white envelope goes into the declaration envelope. Uh, part of the Supreme Court ruling that gave us the extra days uh, for us to receive ballots also uh, made it mandatory that voters have to use that secrecy envelope. If a voter does not use the secrecy envelope, we are not able to count their vote. Um, so that is the secrecy issue. Um, with regard to the candidate levers, that uh, undoubtedly is referring to the straight party ticket. Uh, historically in Pennsylvania, in a general election, voters could go into the in-person voting booth, select Democrat or Republican, and it would vote that whole column for all the Democrats or the Republicans or the independents, whatever their preference. Uh, and likewise, on a mail-in ballot, on a paper ballot, they could just indicate um, all Democrat, all Republican, or all independent on the mail-in ballot and not have the need to circle in each individual candidate for each individual contest. As part of Act 77, which allows us to um, vote by mail with no excuse, and allows us to have these satellite centers. Uh, what it doesn't allow us to do any longer is to have a straight party voting. So at, there's no ability for a voter to just do one button or to just circle one oval. Voters now are required to do each and every race, each and every contest individually. There is no more straight party ticket in Pennsylvania. Thank you. That is actually all the things I had on my list, but I'd like to ask, do you know of anything, any misinformation that people should understand is not correct? What, what is out there? What, are this, what is the messaging that is out there that we need to combat? I would say one of the, uh, one of the things that I hear a lot about, um, and Commissioner Schmidt might, might have a, another piece, but um, that voting by mail is somehow less safe than voting in person. Um, you know, that is just not true. There is no evidence to support that claim. Um, although we are voting for the, fir for the first time uh, with no excuse in this large a number, we did it again in June, uh, we've always voted by mail in Pennsylvania. This is not new. If you were sick or infirmed, or you were uh, disabled, or you were gonna be out of the county, you could always request and receive an absentee ballot and thereby voting by mail. So voting by mail is not new. Only thing that's new is we're allowing more people to be able to do it. Um, so it is as safe as it was when we, we've done it in the past. And I would argue that it's even more safer because we're doing it at such a volume that we have uh, been able to uh, purchase equipment that really um, has, has built in redundancies so, I mean, your mail-in vote is safe and secure as your in-person vote is safe and secure. And I really I should not be a harbinger for anybody to go out and have their voice heard and their vote cast. 
in, a, in a typical election, candidates run against other candidates. In this election cycle, we have candidates running against our electoral system itself and seeking to undermine confidence in that system and the outcome of that system in advance of the election. And that is a distressing thing. Our elections in Philadelphia are bipartisan. I am a registered Republican. The other two commissioners are registered Democrats. Um, we have checks and balances. We have all sorts of mechanisms in place to make sure that every vote is counted and every vote counts. So it's distressing to hear this um, uh, sort of degree of, um, of um, it's distressing to hear people try to undermine the faith of the whole system because they're concerned about the outcome and that may not be in their favor. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions for the commissioners on voting yes. rules? This is Meryl Crean. Um, I'm not so much worried as the, about the safety of a mail-in ballot as I am in whether or not it's going to get counted because of the restricted amount of time that people that you guys will have to count all of the ballots that are coming in and you don't you've never done this before so that that's more the issue I think for people feeling that their vote may not get counted there is no restriction on how long it takes us to count mail-in ballots it could take us however long it takes us so there's no restriction every vote that is every mail-in ballot that is properly completed and that we receive within the, the uh, a lot I of- I thought time. November 6th is the last day of counting. No. no. November 6th is the last day that we can receive a ballot, but we can count, we count until it's, we're done counting. Ah, okay, thank and you. And we will, and we'll count day and night until they're all counted. Uh, we can't begin even opening those envelopes until election day, which is, a real frustration because it means that we can't begin the actual processing of those uh, those ballots until election morning. Um, but thanks to Chairwoman Dealey and the administration, we have taken over a large section of the Pennsylvania Convention Center that's about the size of an airplane hangar at least and set up just a massive operation there so that we can count and count accurately as many mail-in ballots as possible as quickly as possible beginning on election morning. Uh, the only limitation, and it's not gonna take anywhere near that, the only limitation is that the election has to be um, certified 20 days after election day. But we, we can receive ballots back up until three days after election day. But you can't count what you don't even have yet. So you know we'll be receiving ballots for the next uh, few days, obviously, after election day. But you know, uh, our, our goal is to count as many ballots as possible, as quickly as possible. We want the outcome to be clear also. We're the umpires in this thing calling balls and strikes, and we want to make sure the election is fair and done with integrity and done exped uh, expeditiously. So, Al, are you saying that you can start counting before the polls are closed? We can begin counting election morning. Really? We won't report results until after the, uh, the mail-in ballots. Right. We will begin processing those mail-in ballots in the morning of election day. We okay. won't begin reporting those until after the polls close. Okay, good. In Harrisburg, the Republicans and Democrats have been arguing over how many days, and the Republicans had offered three days to allow us to begin processing early. And the Democrats had offered or wanted, I think, 15 days or more. And in typical Harrisburg fashion, we, we got nothing. <laughs> so to me, a compromise between three and 15 would be, I don't know, five or something. But in the, at the end of the day, we've got no additional time. We can only begin counting them on election morning. We want to thank Rabbi Glazier for leading this uh, phase of questioning and thank our commissioners. Before we transition to the next content area, uh, are there additional questions that you as faith leaders have concerning rules 
regarding voters. I wanted to raise a question that uh, came up yesterday regarding the um, veracity of some reports. Um, a a um, client of mine uh, attended a poll manager's training and got out of it that if there were any additional markings, any um, uh, marks or notations on the card that that ballot could be disregarded, um, discounted. Um, is that true or not? On the, you're talking about mail-in ballots, right? Uh, yes. Um, voters should not put additional um, marks on the secrecy envelope that holds the ballot. Um, the point of the secrecy envelope is to separate the vote from the, the voter. So we don't know how you voted or the rabbi voted or bishop voted. Voters will sometimes write information on that envelope. They'll write Al Schmidt or they'll write, you know, to heck with this candidate or, you know, all sorts of stuff, if you can imagine. But they shouldn't add, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't write on that envelope and add, you know, additional uh, commentary on who they support or oppose or who they are. It's a stupid uh, law. I'm sorry to be blunt. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled that there can't be markings on it and that the ballots have to be mailed to us inside of the secrecy envelope, which is inside of the declaration envelope. And the secrecy envelope is intended to, to, to separate the vote from the voter. Is it true that those markings can disqualify the vote? Is it true that those markings can disqualify the vote? They can potentially disqualify the vote. Like if I wrote my name on it or I wrote on it who I support or oppose, um, they could potentially have that vote voided, which okay. is uh, a tra tragedy. All right, thank you. All right, if there are no more questions on the subject of voter rules, we are now going to transition to voter protection and safety. And that line of questioning will be led by our own Bishop Patricia Davenport of the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America uh, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod. Bishop Davenport. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. We're all here because we want to protect the integrity of the democratic process. To that end, I'm generally concerned about election day safety, especially in the areas of voter safety. My own personal act of resistance is showing up at the polls on November 3rd. That has been my practice. Well, you have, have polling places plan provisions for sanitation, PPE? If yes, for whom and how will it be provided? And if no, why not? Um, Commissioner Dealey, that one is for you. I actually have three. What type of security is being provided at the polling sites given some of the recent threats we have seen on social media. Commissioner Sabir, that's for you. How are we notifying voters of their rights when entering the polling place and the tasks of poll watchers? Commissioner Smith, that's for you. In addition, for all of the paper ballots that we've talked about um, extensively, what measures have been put into place to assure us that they will be delivered safely to the Office of Elections or the Convention Center now that we're hearing. And that's for any of the three. three. All right, so I'll go first. I think I got everything you said. Um, first of all, we are uh, so pleased to, to be able to, to uh, share this responsibility with the collection of the ballots. Uh, we um, have a great partnership with Sheriff uh, Rochelle Bilal and deputy sheriffs are handling um, the transport of the ballots that are coming in at the satellite centers. Um, 
as with regard to security, uh, you know, we uh, we equipped each judge of elections that works for us um, a cell phone uh, that they can call in the event that there's uh, anything going on inside the polling place that you know we should know about. Of course, if there is a, a threat to their health or safety, they should call 911. Um, we uh, we do not, you know, a lot of what you're seeing and hearing about on on Facebook or on social media ha relates to um, the activities that go on outside of the polling place uh, with watchers and such. Um, that is not in our administration or jurisdiction. That is handled um, in a great, another uh, fine partnership with the district attorney's office and district attorney Larry Krasner, he um, had a press conference just last week where he announced uh, that his uh, election as courts will be uh, amped up and started early because we have these uh, satellite election offices. So um, as we get closer to election day for the in-person voting, uh, DA Krasner will have a, a, a hotline number available for people to call that feel as though um, they are being in intimidated or there's undue influence uh, that they're experiencing at the polls because uh, quite frankly, nobody wants that. In addition to that, um, as part of our efforts to maintain, you know, order and to maintain the ability for voters to uh, vote freely and fairly, we will have uh, city voters that will be uh, deployed throughout the city that will be uh, throughout the day uh, checking the temperature and making sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, so we are uh, amp amping up our efforts to make sure that we have eyes on the ground. Um, all day long, all day and night on election day to make sure that if there's any uh, activity that is not, uh, you know, is not conducive to uh, the ability for voters to vote, uh, we will be able to respond accordingly either uh, with the district attorney's office or police or however um, that will get handled depending on the situation. Uh, PPE will be provided to the elections, to the poll workers. Uh, they will have masks, face shields, um, plastic uh, guards. Uh, there will be uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant and each voter will be given a glove to operate the voting machine. Um, masks will also be available for any voter that does not uh, have one on. However, by law, we are not uh, allowed to uh, make a, the wearing of the mask mandatory. Uh, but we will, uh, we have masks that will be available and that will be provided for any voter that doesn't have one. I think I covered all your, all your questions, but I, I'm not, if I didn't just come back to me. No, thank you so much. That was right on point. Um, uh, actually, because I lit, that's my act of resistance, but also um, I'm talking with my mom who also has that in her. Um, my encouragement to her was mail it in and it's like, no, I have a right to do this and I'm going. And so, um, yeah, and I live within that population. So I wanted to assure them that they would be safe if that is definitely their intention. And you did um, answer that. So um, Commissioner Sabir. I'm looking in the chat and it seems as though Commissioner Sabir had a prior engagement and he had to um, leave earlier, but he thanks you all for uh, the opportunity. Well, that leaves it on you, Commissioner Smith. Well, Bishop, I wouldn't be an elected official in Philadelphia if I didn't pander a bit. And I was raised <laughs> ELCA in the Western Pennsylvania Synod uh, growing up, although I'm, I'm now Anglican, um, which wasn't that difficult of a jump. Uh, we, still love me. we still love you. <laughs> I was raised ELCA, but went to Catholic school. So it's not really a surprise that I would wind up Anglican at the end of the day. Um, for poll watchers, poll watchers play a very important role. And that is um, they're watching inside of the polling place on behalf of candidates and on behalf of parties to make sure that there's nothing going on in the polling place that is inappropriate or illegal. So you don't have people inside of the polling place handing out election materials. You don't have election board workers checking people in and saying, oh, by the way, don't forget to vote for this person or that person. 
or anything like that. But there are real restrictions on that activity inside of the polling place for a reason. The only people allowed inside of a polling place are the election board workers, the voters in the act of voting, like in line and cast it, checking in and casting their vote, and poll watchers who have to stand at a distance from all of this, they're observers, they can only inspect the election materials like the poll books and all the rest when there are no voters in the room. They're not allowed behind the voting machines, they're not allowed to talk to voters, interrogate voters, interfere with anything in any way or else we reach out to our partners, like the chairwoman said, at the district attorney's office to go out and sort of remind people of what, uh, what the law is and what the, what the rules are with regard to their behavior inside of the point place. So poll watchers have a role. They're from campaigns and parties, like I said, and they apply to us for a poll watcher certificate, which is a sort of credential that we issue that allows for this extraordinary circumstance where you have people other than the election board workers and the voters inside of the polling place. They're inside of the polling place, but they can't photograph voters. Like I said, they can't talk to voters. They can't you know, suggest that they vote for or against a candidate or interfere with anything in any way. So that's the, the role of um, poll watchers. In terms of the rights that voters have, and there are a few, because there is obviously no requirement that you speak English or Spanish to be able to vote. It's a right as an American citizen. There's no requirement that you be able to see or hear or be literate or anything else like that. So there are all sorts of um, accommodations that the Board of Elections makes to assist people who fall in those categories. In areas where there are large numbers of non-English speaking voters, we assign um, uh, interpreters or translators to a lot of those places. Uh, we train and dispatch as many interpreters as, as we ha can possibly get on election day for a number of different languages. We have a card on the table where you check in that has uh, information in I think 20 different languages. Every election board is provided with a cell phone so that if someone comes in who can only speak a language um, that, uh, that is different than you know, the, the language that the election board speaks or is on the machine, we can connect them to something called the language line that allows them to call up and sort of walk through the voting process um, and assistance that way. The machines are equipped with, uh, uh, it's called a sip and puff device to assist um, voters uh, who are unable to sort of manually make their uh, selections. There are headphones in the event the voter is vision impaired and can't sort of see the ballot, it reads the ballot so they can hear it and make selections. So we try to accommodate um, everyone we can. With 1.1 million registered voters in Philadelphia, it is likely impossible for us to accommodate everyone all the time. And every vote is precious to us and we don't want any voter to feel or be disenfranchised by the process. So we, take, we make every accommodation that we possibly can uh, for voters who are in those different categories. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, just for the sake of time, I want to offer my colleagues um, the opportunity to ask questions on um, safety so that we can keep it moving as we seem to be losing some of our faith leaders. Does anyone know the, 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 the phone number? Uh, is there a hotline to get directly to the DA's uh, task force on the day of the election if, if there are issues of voter intimidation? I do not have it. There, there's a phone number, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. That's a hotline that could probably direct you to any that's, issue that comes up. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, brother. 
because I was looking for it. It's up here on my desk, buried somewhere. May you be re rewarded. I mean, <laughs> tell me that there's... unfortunately, we all we all have it. None of us are in all three of us are in locations other than City Hall right now. We're at all three different, you know, remote locations. So um, the, the di district attorney had a press release the other day and a press conference that my colleague discussed where they publicized that number. The number isn't just for Election Day. It's the lead up to Election Day as well. So if somebody shows up at one of the satellite locations to uh, to vote like Rabbi Glazer did um, and they encounter a problem they can call the hotline number now or in the days ahead up until and including election day to report any any um, intimidation or any other issues like that that the district attorney would handle. Thank you Dr. Wright for that question I was actually going to say you mean to tell me that there was something that wasn't on philadelphiavotes.com? <laughs> That's probably there too, by the way. <laughs> we want to thank uh, Bishop Davenport. Uh, and we, we'd like to... We'd like to thank Bishop Davenport for uh, facilitating the questions around uh, voter protection and safety. Are there any additional questions from our faith leaders regarding this subject before we transition to uh, the final topic? If you are not speaking, uh, please mute your telephone so that it does not compromise our communications. All right, moving right ahead. We'd like to thank Bishop Davenport for uh, addressing those questions. And now we would like to move to the final section of content, and that has to do with issues regarding city governance that is found on the ballot. Uh, and that will be led by Imam Kenneth Nuruddin of the Philadelphia Mass Jib. Imam? Okay, uh, to the commissioners, again, we thank you for your patience and your endurance, but the fight has just begun. So uh, here we are. Now, uh, Commissioner Omar, I'm, I don't know if he left because he used to be a student of mine here at Claire Muhammad. So maybe he thought I would get an assignment and he checked out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we are not uh, here to look at the content of the, uh, the ballot questions. But what we want to look at is the policy and procedure. And I don't know if many of us know, but the question, how are ballot questions put on the ballot? So ballot questions are put on the ballot either by uh, Philadelphia City Council or by the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And Almost so all of them involve one of two things. They are either amendments to the city charter, which is sort of like the, con the constitution of the city of Philadelphia, or amendments to the, the um, Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Anytime you change those, it requires that those changes be put on the ballot uh, for voters to vote, you know, up or down, because it's a pretty big deal to change uh, the city's constitution or the, the Commonwealth's constitution. And the city's constitution, the, that's the home rule charter, right? That's yeah, the home, the home rule charter. charter. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, but it's essentially like the same thing. It's our governing document for how we we function. And it's not something that is easily changed. So it requires um, a charter change to do that. And most of those charter changes involve, and you might see this, it could this be problem. create a an office of this or that. Um, that might just be created by a mayor and could go away once that mayor That's leaves. So but to change it, it makes it a mandatory thing that the city government does. 
and it comes before the voters to say they're in favor of it or not. The other category, which you'll see almost every election, is authorizing the city to borrow money for different things, Ooh. like rec centers or bridges or different uh, programs or procedures or things like that. So the two biggest categories by far are charter changes and uh, borrowing money. The city, the city is not allowed to function in debt, but it can borrow money for certain narrow categories like uh, capital expenditures and things like that. And it requires a charter change to do that. Now, if the uh, ballot questions are affirmed, they're answered in the affirmative, is there any notification of the voting public so they can be involved in policy and procedure for implementation? That's, Chairwoman. Yeah, I think Lisa has her phone muted. She's trying to talk. Sorry. So, I mean, that the ballot question uh, results are, are election results. So just like uh, you can find out, you know, if a candidate won or lost, you can also go on. Come on, you know the answer. Philadelphia. <laughs> and you can find out the, uh, the determination of a ballot question. Um, depending on the question, most of those questions, um, especially the one like the ones for uh, November the third, uh, they were they're all introduced by uh, city council people. So uh, it's their desire to see this. They're working on behalf of their constituents. So the best way for you to help with the implementation of said questions uh, is to contact your city council person and tell them. For example, uh, ballot question number one it is, should the city um, stop the practice of stop and frisk? So if that's something that you want to get involved in, the education of that, should that come to pass as yes, we're not, you know, we won't be doing that anymore as a city, then you would contact your um, city council person. Or if you, if the question about uh, should the city um, start an office for the uh, victim, victim services, um, if that's something that you think that you want to be involved in, should it pass, then you would contact your city council person. Um, that's, that, that's pretty much the best way to do it because they, they become uh, policies uh, and uh, departments within city government. So you want to talk to your city council people who put them on the ballot. We all um, put them up and you vote on them. That's, that's our, we're like uh, Commissioner Schmidt said, we're the umpires. We call strikes, balls, win, you know, wins and losses. We don't get involved in if they ever really implement those things. Yeah, I, I guess that the question is, uh, could this, just as the city com commissioners, they validate the vote and they tell you uh, we have a timeline as to when it should be validated. Should we have some type of timeline? It's the same thing, sir. Th those, th that result will be given to you when all the results for November the 3rd are done. It'll be how many yeses and how many no's. Yes. That'll be it. That's now, if there's a timeline on whether or not they implement that, that, like I said, is a question for uh, the folks in the city government whose, char whose charge that is. Okay, that was the main question. Now, any other questions from any of the colleagues? Hello. Go right ahead, Bishop. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go right ahead, Bishop. Okay, uh, Sister Lisa, when something has a financial implication, does not have to have coincide with the budgetary process with the city? It, it, it will, but again, it has to go before uh, the voters. Right. For, for a yes or no, and then it gets added to the capital budget or the op whatever the whatever the budget is that it, it called it was called into it not most of the time uh, it is the capital budget but okay. it, goes, it goes through uh, the government offices and the government the city government so we just say the results right. what happens after that is 
the responsibility of those folks that are responsible for that. Right. Are there any other questions for the commissioners regarding city governance issues as it relate to the ballot questions? Going once, going okay. twice. Are there any final questions for Commissioners Daly and Commissioner Smith with respect to uh, city governance or any of the other content areas that we covered and you uh, require additional information? Okay, it appears not. So City Commissioners uh, Dealey and Smith, we're going to ask if you would be kind enough just to give some closing guidance and advisement to our viewers. Well, first of all, I would like to just say thank you very much. Um, this has been, a, it's always been a, a something that I've always enjoyed. I, I like doing this at breakfast though, because I know you always have a great breakfast and that's where we typically, <laughs> we typically meet. I also will say that I unfortunately will miss the prayer at the end because I have to be off for a 515 call. Uh, but, you know, not to, uh, the most important thing that should come out of this, I hope, is that it is of the utmost importance for everybody to be a voter. Everybody has one vote. The power is with the people. You have to go and exercise that power. You have to go out and you have to be a voter. Um, it's the most important thing uh, at the most important time. So we rely on people to be uh, conduits for us to make sure that voters in Philadelphia are getting trusted information. And we hope uh, spending this time we have this afternoon and having this uh, vibrant discussion that we have uh, given you enough information so that you can be a trusted source uh, for your, constitu your constituencies, your congregations. And, you know, <clears throat> all jokes aside, it, when in doubt, always just tell them to go to phillyvotes.com or they can, uh, we have a Twitter handle at, at Philly Votes. Commissioner Schmidt, Commissioner Sevier are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as am I. So, and we are uh, easily accessible on all those social media platforms. And I'm just, you know, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for doing what I know you will do, which, was, which will be a trusted source uh, for your congregants so that they can have be armed with all the knowledge they need uh, to participate in the process. Whether it's on November 3rd in person or whether it is uh, before that by mail, whether in person or from their homes. So thank you all. I continue, you know, we are moving around a little more freely in Philadelphia, but certainly we know that we are still in a pandemic. So most importantly, uh, be safe and well, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Dealey. Uh, Commissioner Smith, any final uh, advisement and guidance for our viewers? We're a very small department of the city uh, of Philadelphia. Most of the time, most people don't know that we exist at all. And then in a presidential general election, all the attention and 1.1 uh, million constituents, 1.1 uh, million registered voters and their concerns and their you know, interest in voting and their ability to vote uh, is all on our department. And with a limited number of people and a limited budget, it's difficult for us to make our voice heard. That's why we rely on organizations like yours, who are sort of networks of networks, who can help get that word out to voters so that they, um, they know uh, and are informed and exercise their right to vote um, on election day. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Dealey, for being with us this afternoon. You have provided invaluable information that will certainly guide us 
in guiding our respective congregations. Uh, we appreciate so very much your availability this afternoon. Thank you, Doctor. At this time, we'd like to provide an opportunity for our faith leaders uh, who have collaborated to produce this election roundtable. If you have closing observations and appeals to voters with respect to voter mobilization, we invite our faith leaders at this time to communicate. Once again, if there are any faith leaders on the call who would like to offer some guidance and closing observations or even appeals to voters before we hear from Bishop Ingram, we ask you to share that at this time. I would just like to encourage um, everyone who is um, under the sound of our voice and had the opportunity to hear from the commissioners to get clarification about how we move forward to do just that. Go vote, move forward. You know, you know now the many opportunities that you have to lift up your voice and to be counted. So please take this information, don't file it away, utilize it and go vote. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Reverend Dr. Malcolm Bird for, for his willingness to, to call together and create this forum for the faith leaders and those who are listening in. I believe the faith community now has enough information that we can go to our faith communities and urge them with, with, the, with, with, with the most uh, prophetic way that we can uh, using our ministerial skills to sh tell people and to show them how important this election is and how important it is to exercise our constitutional right to vote and to help them navigate through whatever needs to be navigated through so that we all have an opportunity to vote. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other leaders before we hear from Bishop Ingram? Hey. All right. It appears that there are no other uh, comments or observations or voter appeals. So with that, we'd like to uh, surrender this time to Bishop Gregory Ingram. Again, the prelate for the First Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, he will have his observations and remarks and then close us in his own way in prayer. Uh, Bishop Ingram. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Bird. Um, in the essence of time, because I have another meeting to get to, can I just give the closing prayer? If, yes, sir. Okay, let us pray. Our Father and our God in whom we live, move and have our being, we thank you for this moment, this, these, this time of reflection, this time of a roundtable dialogue and discussion and forum. Thank you for the commissioners and elected officials who shared information and gave us inspiration. We pray that God, you will be with us as we move forward. As we engage in uh, that which we would be pleasing in your sight, we pray that God, that you will watch over us and guide us in an atmosphere and a climate that's filled with confusion and chaos. We ask, oh God, that you will bring a semblance of peace that will pass all understanding. God, as we are engaged in uh, this voter registration and drive and election, we come knowing, dear God, that we are faced with an undaunting and unpredictable future. But we also know, dear God, that you're in our midst. Where there's confusion, we pray that you bring clarity. 
but there's doubt and pray that you will give us semblance of hope, where despair will give us courage. We thank you, dear God, for the leadership that's been demonstrated here today from the various faith leaders, and particularly with Dr. Malcolm Byrd. Ask the God that as we move forward, we move forward knowing that we serve a God with two outstretched hands, one strong enough to deal with us and to be with us and encourages us and surrounds us with justice, and yet another arm that is compassion that surrounds us and embraces us with your love and with your grace. Jesus said, know that as we walk, we walk by faith and not by sight. We ask that God as we move forward to know that it's better to walk in the dark with God than walk alone in the light. Better to walk with him by faith and walk alone by sight. And as we move forward, dear God, we thank you for the unity in the spirit that has made us one today. We ask that God that you will be with us in this moment of, of a virus, in this moment of a pandemic. And yet we know that you are a God that can heal and answer prayer. We thank you for this day. May you be with us and may you bless us. Now, as we go forward in our own traditions, we say thank you, we praise you, we glorify your name, for your name is worthy to be praised. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. If you are still with us, you have witnessed the first inaugural Philadelphia Faith Leaders Election Roundtable. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our faith leaders and our Philadelphia City Commissioners for joining us and making this possible. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Bird. God bless you. God bless have, you. Have a good and safe evening, sir. Thank you, sir.